standing in front of here right now some tablets that were found in 1723 down in a creek. And these tablets describe what the first process of creating deeds and transferring uh, property. It talked about how to set up the boundaries, how to set the points up for the boundaries. The time frame of this is in the first century BC. It goes through and gives measurements and it describes how the grantor and the grantee would transfer property that wouldn't like end after so many years. It could continue and that they own it. This becomes very important because today we look at how property transfers. It doesn't sever after a certain amount of time and go back to the grantor. The grantee has the right to continue to do this. So historically, way back in the first century, they determined very much the need of describing how land needed to be found. The two bronze tables found in 1732, on the bed of the Salanderla Creek, in the territory of Heracle, bear, on their front face, two Greek inscriptions datable between the end of the 4th and the beginning of the 3rd century BC. On the back part of the first table, an important legislative text in Latin was engraved in the first half of the 1st century BC. The Greek texts attest the state of ruin and abandon of lands sacred to Dionysus and Athena Polias, made worse by the illicit occupation of land. The people assembly summed in an extraordinary session, approved a decree to remedy, by means of these drastic measures, renewing of the boundaries by setting sippy. Sippy or sippus are boundary stones. They demarcated the routes of private roads or the distance of public ones, as well as delimiting the sacred boundary of Rome, the Palmyrium, and the banks of the Tiber. Sippy marked the course of an aqueduct and separated its space, which was to be left clear of development, from public or private land. Because these stones were progressively numbered, they also effectively served as milestones. Introduced by Augustus, their disposition was overseen by the curator Aquarium, who maintained the aqueducts to ensure a sufficient supply of water to Rome although concessions for the private consumption were the prerogative of the emperor. The tablet goes on in stipulating rent contracts with different tariffs and duration according to the state of the cultivated land that obliged the tenants to ensure the restoration and maintenance of canals and roads, not to mortgage the land to produce guarantors every five years. The rents were only paid in kind. Other tables dating 60 to 30 BC were found that described land rights and measurements. It stated that Asippus was placed to mark the extending of the Pierium of the colony of Capua by Caesar Octavian, who latter took the name of Augustus, adoptive son of Julius Caesar. The colony was founded in the Campanian Augur by Julius Caesar in 59 BC, and was extended by Octavian in 36 BC. The Pierium was the limit of the urban space, the sacred living area, placed under divine protection, i.e. inaugurated. The marking of the city limits by means of sacred line is one of the most ancient rites of the Italic people, and is of a Tuscan origin. There were many activities that could be carried out only within or without the Pyrium. On one of the sides of the Sippi delaminating this area was a number indicating their position within the series of boundary stones they belonged to. On the other side, was Athe same of the Emperor, in the nominative case, accompanied by his titles. What we're standing in front of here today, right now, is a description of boundary markers and being placed into location and saying that once the boundary mark has been set, no matter if it was put in the right or wrong location, it was set and could not be changed. Boundary locations and projections became very important, even in the early times, dating back to 1 BC. In England, the system was an arrangement between the king, noblemen, and vessels. The arrangement included an intricate set of rules for the tenure and transfer of real property. The noblemen ruled over the tenants of the land. These landlords protected their vessels but expect them to pay rent on the land they used and to pay allegiance to their lord. The land was in possession of the lord and could not be sold. Land could on only be owned by a person of title, hence the term of land title. Land passed to the eldest son by inheritance. In the case of no male decedents it would go to the next male relationship, which is title by entail, no longer in practice. Vassals or peasants had not changed to own land. In 1086, William the Conqueror made a survey for tax purposes that included every far more estate and its owners. This was known as the Doomsday Book. Besides being useful for collecting tax, it allowed him to demand allegiance. As people turned to agriculture to crafts and trade in villages and cities, they curbed the power of kings and began to think of ownership of land without fealty to the Lord, with obligation of service, and with the right dispose of the land as they saw fit. As they had no title it was difficult to transfer ownership. 
a concept of fief or fee land ownership or feudal load holding euros. A royal or noble personage granted a fiefdom, meaning a degree of interest in the use or revenues of a given parcel of land. A tenant may also pay homage a lord by duty such as knight service and receive lands. The feudal land tenure system later fell to a simple ownership versus a service ownership, without conditions attached to the tenancy. The ownership of real property free and clear of any landlord or sovereign is a lodial title and is rare globally. A lodial title may not be distressed and restrained for collection of taxes or private debts or condemned by eminent domain. Most land globally is held in common law ownership. Julius Caesar created civil law or the law of civilization where his statutes or written laws govern the people and land. Laws had to be written into statutes on tablets for everyone to be ruled. Civil law was in use into 1900s globally as a means to understand land ownership. Common law, also known as judicial precedent or judge-made law, or case law, is that body of law derived from judicial decisions of courts and similar tribunals. The defining characteristic of common law is that it arises as precedent. In cases where the parties disagree on what the law is, a common law court looks to past precedential decisions of relevant courts, and synthesizes the principles of those past cases as applicable to the current facts. So it's important for us to know the history of global land ownership and the terms that were used for global land ownership as we move forward. When we use the GIS to represent how land is held or maintained in the United States and globally. Uh, these common terms that are used in the law help us to understand such as owning minerals uh, through a fee, you know, having leaseors or leasees uh, for minerals or surface rights and, and how that uh, is, is determined becomes important to building the database because the words in terms of the legal aspect of land ownership is what we want to try to represent in a land titling or a land property management system. So good luck and have a great day.